here for this second highlight lecture. And this highlight lecture is titled Viewing the Freshwater Crisis from Space, a World of Drought and Flood Extremes. And when we chose this topic as, uh, for a highlight lecture, we did not know what would happen here in Europe in terms of floods last month, that happened last month. So I think this topic and talking about this topic is extremely up to date today. This highlight lecture will present an overview of the global freshwater hazards and demonstrate how space science is making a significant difference in our ability to cope with such extreme events utilizing satellite data that directly target these problems. And it is my great pleasure to introduce to you our speaker here, Professor Bates. He is a professor at the University of Bristol and he will be your speaker for this highlight lecture. So please welcome him with a round of applause. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, everyone. And uh, thank you for coming to see me at this late hour. I understand there's beer going on in the exhibition hall. So uh, I'm doubly grateful that you've sacrificed uh, the possibility of a beer to come and listen to me. Um, so. I'm going to talk a little bit about the freshwater crisis and uh, particularly about the topics of floods and droughts and also think a little bit about what space can do for us in that respect. So just by way of background on, on global flood and drought risk. Well, we have some data over, over a period of uh, uh, time that are global averages of the, the losses due to these hazards. If we look in a UN database called MDAT, we can see that global uh, flood losses over a, a, approximately a 20-year period affect, on average, about 75 million people a year. They cause, on average, about 40 billion US dollars in damages and an awful lot of fatalities. Droughts as well over that same period. Droughts as well over that same period, um, from 1998 to 2017, caused about 124 billion US dollars of damage. And in 2022 alone, $32 billion of losses due to droughts was, uh, was estimated. And these, these are probably gross underestimates of the amount of losses and uh, impacts that we face. These, national, these global scale databases only really include the very largest event. So we know that all the small attritional uh, impacts are not recorded in these uh, events. And we also know that there's significant upward pressure as well as a result of two things, climate changes and also population increases and migration. So let's have a look at a few examples of, of events that, that have been in the news recently that, that are uh, instructive. And one particular one I'd like to look at just now is the, the Pakistan floods of 2022. You can see in this nice slide from the, the Joint Research Center of the European Commission and NASA that there are um, is uh, some very nice, oops, sorry, let's go back. There we go, there's the beamer. Um, so you can see the extent of, uh, uh, or the area of Pakistan that was in, uh, impacted by these floods. And you can also see the rainfall accumulations. Two and a half month rainfall accumulations upwards of 1,000 millimeters. Seven day forecast rainfalls upwards of 500 millimeters. And these are incredible amounts of water falling. And around about 1,700 people died in this event. It's a, it's a truly tragic loss of life. The flooding covered almost 10% of Pakistan and, and uh, impacted tens of millions of people, um, as well as significant uh, economic losses. And I thought also, because I was in Italy, I'd, I'd look at the recent Emilia Romana floods from May 2023. And these, these events caused a similar amount of damage to the, to the Pakistan floods, but far fewer deaths. And, and that's a typical... Uh, closer. Is that better? Okay. Sounds quite loud to me on stage. Um, uh, uh, and also caused the cancellation of the F1 Grand Prix that year as well, which I'm, I'm sure was not good news in Italy. Um, in terms of droughts, it's a similar story. We've had globally significant droughts in the US causing multiple tens of billions of uh, US dollars of economic losses. In Brazil at the moment, the Amazon River is at a 120-year low at the river gauge in Manaus. And you can see that graph in, in the lower left corner. 
And in Europe 2022, we had a significant one in 500 year return interval drought. Um, and you can see the mapping of the, the drought impacts across the whole continent. And these things might not actually be disconnected. There's good reasons to believe that there are, there are some connections between droughts and floods. In fact, the Pakistan floods and the Emilia Romana floods both followed periods of extensive droughts. Um, the period before the Pakistan floods was actually a heat wave in that country. Uh, and the preceding year to the Emilia Romana floods was that significant European drought that I've just talked about. And there's lots of suggested physical mechanisms why that might actually be scientifically sensible that these, these things are connected. We certainly know that low soil moisture leads to greater convection in the atmosphere and therefore increased precipitation. Soil sealing can lead to reduced infiltration and greater runoff. And we also know that there are also factors that mitigate against that. So it's, it's not a, a very uh, clear picture. But we know at least there are some things that may make flooding post-drought more likely. So let's have a think about what climate change might do to all these patterns. And here's some uh, plots of a, uh, that, from a paper that I co-authored that came out earlier this year, which show how extreme rainfalls, extreme river flows, and sea levels are changing over the 21st century. And this is a combination of CMIP5 and CMIP6 data. So what you can see is that the spatial patterns for those different drivers of river flooding are very different. And that leads, leads to a, a very uh, distinct geography of overall changes in risk and loss. Extreme rainfalls. Well, rainfall increases more or less everywhere. So in these graphs, green colors are an increase above historical baseline. Red colors, or well, brownie uh, colors, are a decrease above historic, a decrease from historical baseline. And you can see that for extreme rainfall, most places it's increasing. Some places in relative terms quite markedly, um, typically places where it's already dry, but still increases over most parts of the world. Sea level as well, that, that also increases in most places. Um, by a spatially variable amount, depending on how close you are to the poles, uh, as a result of isostatic rebound as a, uh, and glacial unloading. But nevertheless, the trend is al almost universally upwards. For extreme river flows, it's a much more mixed picture. There's a combination of browns and greens in these graphs. Um, in lots of places, actually, river flow, is extreme river flows are forecast to go down. And we can think in a little bit about reasons why that might be. And you probably can't see it on these graphs, but there's, there's quite a difference in the level of certainty we have over these changes as well. We're much less certain about what the future changes in extreme river flow might be, because predicting river flows is, is much more complex than predicting rainfalls or, or sea levels. The causes of that are fairly well known. In terms of rainfall, it's the clausius clapeyron effect. This is, the, this is the mechanism by which warmer atmospheres hold more moisture. If they can hold more moisture, more can precipitate. And for very short duration events, we, researchers have also seen what's known as super clausius clapeyron scaling, by which moisture content increases by more than 7% per degree. We also have dynamical atmosphere changes. We have sea level rise due to steric effects. That's the, the heating up of the oceans and also ice sheet melting. We've got vegetation changes and reduced snow melt because of increased, uh, increased snow melt because of re, uh, increased temperatures. But then for river flows, even though we're expecting more rain, some of the time that increased rainfall falls on drier ground because the intra-event periods uh, are drier and there's more evapotranspiration during them. And therefore, that's the reason why the, why the picture for river flows in the future is, is much more spatially mixed. Put all those things together, and we can use numerical models to come up with some spatial um, patterns of global flood hazard change. And again, this is a plot from one of our latest papers, where we built a global flood inundation model at 30 meter resolution and use that to simulate both current areas at risk of flooding and the areas of risk in flooding under two different climate scenarios. SSP 2.1, 2.6, you could think of that as a, as a best case scenario. 
if we stick to the Paris Agreement targets, that dark blue line is probably where we will track. We're not on it at the moment. We're tracking somewhere above that. So the other line is possibly, you could think of as a, a plausible worst case scenario. That's SSP 5, 8.5. And that's what happens if we, we really miss the Paris Agreement targets and the climate turns out to be a lot more sensitive to CO2 than we currently think. So in reality, we're tracking somewhere in the middle, but here are, here are two M members that bracket where we might go in the future. And the shaded areas that you see are our, our uncertainty because the CMIP6 and CMIP5 models have a spread. There's, there's a number of models in those ensembles and the, the, the shaded area represents the model spread um, uh, uh, about the, the mean tendency. And what you can see in this is that, you know, if we stick to the Paris Agreement targets, as soon as we hit peak CO2, actually flood hazards stabilize and, and stop rising. But if we track on SSP at 8.5, then those increases in hazards are still going on towards the end of the century, particularly for sea level rise, which I'm sure you know, keeps rising for centuries after we hit peak CO2 emissions. Sea level rise, sea level rise is still increasing in 2300, um, even if we stopped all CO2 inputs to the atmosphere right now. And then drought is a similar kind of process as well. Uh, it's a complex interplay of changing temperature, precipitation, and human decisions. We've got more rainfall in most places, some exceptions, but also we've got higher temperatures, more evapotranspiration, drier soils, and a reduced snowpack. And therefore, drought becomes much more frequent in the 21st century. There's a very nice plot in a paper by Sato et al., that looks at the frequency of drought days by the mid-21st century. And you can see in the, in the images that there's a lot of parts of the world where drought days become much more frequent. Um, and again, just like floods, what they show in this paper is there's, there's a significant difference between the, climate scenario, between the climate scenarios we might track on. Again, just as in our paper, they're, they're bracketing the end members, best case scenario and plausible worst case. Where we are at the moment is, is probably somewhere in between, but you can't tell what, what uh, emissions are going to look like. So emissions scenarios make a big difference to the change in frequency of droughts. And there's also a big difference in people's ability uh, or, or the economic impact of those. That's not uh, spatially constant either. So this is some World Bank analysis which shows the econo economic costs of droughts from 1994 to 2014. Not for all of the world. I mean, some parts of, uh, of the globe here are grey shaded out. But for the areas where the World Bank were able to get data, you can see significant variations in the cumulative mean costs of uh, drought as a percentage of GDP. And many of the places that are least well able to cope have the highest ratios in this respect. And whilst I'm a physical scientist, it's clear that we also need to think about what's happening with humans on the planet as well. Risk is a, is a function of both a hazard, vulnerability, and exposure. And we know that populations are increasing in some parts of the world and stabilizing and even falling in others. Particularly over Africa, climate is, is projected to grow extremely quickly. And it's not just population change, it's also migration, aging, urbanization and a concentration of risk. So even these headline figures conceal potentially an awful lot of concentrations of risk in particular parts of the world. Now, this is a space conference, so we ought to think about the role of space in, in monitoring the hydrological cycle. And the answer is that there is, there's an awful lot that, that the space community can offer. There's a very nice diagram here from a paper um, uh, that was published quite recently showing the huge variety of remote sensing techniques we can deploy in order to help monitor the hydrological cycle and, and measure essential climate variables. It goes everything from drones operating a few hundred metres above the deck right up to geostationary meteorological satellites in all but tens of thousands of kilometres above the Earth. And the main space agencies have for years produced programs to 
uh, monitor particular important aspects of the water cycle. However, if we're thinking about floods and droughts, we have a big challenge for the space community, and that is intermittency. Floods and droughts are, by their very nature, rare events. They happen infrequently. They're transient, sometimes very transient. And often, we're interested in events that have not occurred in the past. We're interested in knowing what's the, the impact of the one in 500 year drought or the one in 100 year flood. Something that our, mo our ground and satellite instrumental records are very unlikely to have mapped in all the places that we, were, we might be concerned about. And we also want to know what's going to happen in the future as well. Uh, and for that reason, and that's not something we can yet design a satellite to help us with. And therefore, we have a challenge, and that is to fuse the data that we get from satellites with numerical environmental models in order to be able to interpolate and extrapolate to both into extreme events and into the future. Unfortunately, this work is ongoing. We have a, have a strong community of scientists fusing satellite data with numerical modeling. And numerical modelers like myself are increasingly um, uh, brought in to discussions about satellite missions so we can advise on exactly the, the variables that we need to improve our, our techniques. So, for the, uh, for the rest of the uh, lecture, I'm going to talk just a little bit about what satellites we have available for monitoring the water cycle. Here's a standard USGS diagram of the water cycle. It's the kind of thing that, that you teach in primary school these days. Certainly, uh, certainly you do in the UK. And it's something you're all probably very familiar with. And the message, really, from this talk, if you wanted to go home with one or two take-home messages, is that now, for the first time, we really have the majority, almost all major elements of the water cycle, being able to be measured from space. So, for example, we have a group of satellites, ISAT-2, Cryosat, that measure snow and ice on the, on the Earth's surface. We have missions like SMAP, which measure uh, uh, soil moisture. GRACE and GRACE follow-on, which measure groundwater storage and, and changes in total water storage um, at, at, at reasonable resolutions across the planet. GPM measures precipitation. And then we have a whole bunch of both optical images, images like MODIS and various synthetic aperture radars, as well as Landsat and altimetry which measure the fresh water cycle. And the one thing we've really been missing, uh, uh, which has been solved relatively recently, has been an ability to measure both stream flow, uh, river slopes, and river lake, uh, and lake levels across the whole planet in high fidelity. And that's a gap that's been recently filled by the uh, Surface Water Ocean Topography Satellite Mission. There was a, a, a joint program of NASA, CNES, the Canadian Space Agency and the UK Space Agency. And I'll talk a little bit about that towards the end of my talk because that's a mission that I've been involved in for the last 20 years. So, we now have almost all elements of the water cycle mapped. So let's have a look at some of these satellites because they, some of the technology that's been being deployed is really quite incredible. Now, this is one I'm not involved with, but it's the one that I personally find most fascinating in terms of how it works. And this is GRACE and its successor, GRACE Follow-On. Now, GRACE stands for the Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment, and it actually measures the change in total water surface on planet Earth. It, typically about 300-kilometer resolution and, and monthly or bi-monthly timescales. So fairly coarse space and time scales, but the way it does this is fascinating. So there are two satellites in, in orbit. They're both about the size of a, a, a regular car. And the distance between the two satellites is, is measured extremely precisely with a microwave link. So as these satellites travel over the Earth's surface, variations in, very small variations in the Earth's gravity field cause these satellites to either slow up, uh, slow down or speed up as they go over things like mountain belts or, or areas of ice 
or at large bodies of water which are changing in time. And because there are two satellites, as, as the first one starts to transit, say, a mountain belt, it changes speed, and the distance between it and the following satellite changes. And then, as the second one catches up, it too feels the gravity mass underneath it, and its speed, therefore, starts to match the first. And by v measuring how these satellites are changing in position relative to each other, we can effectively, with the, ex the gravi gravi accelerometers and gravimeters on board, actually weigh the column of... Uh, 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 the, the column of Earth between the top of the atmosphere to the middle of the core, um, uh, uh, all the way down to the center. And if you think about it, the only thing that's changing in that column is water. You know, water's moving around on the planet. The, the mountains are pretty fixed. They don't change too much, at least not on these time scales. But water moves around a lot, and therefore we can see that from space. So here, for example, is the, the Amazon flood wave. Uh, this is an annual time series of 15-day uh, average storage anomalies from GRACE. So this is measured in centimeters. And it's the, it, you can think about it, it's the volume of water changing um, as you go. I'm not sure this pointer works terribly well on the screen. But what you can see in the, in the lower uh, set of panels is that there's um, Oh, let's go from top to bottom. So the red is areas of extra water. And you can see the rain band moving from north to south over the Amazon. And you can see the flood wave actually moving down the river system and out to sea. And then as you go through to the second half of the year, the rain belt is over the northern tributaries of the Amazon. And again, those are then um, getting activated and kicking off uh, uh, and, and pouring water down into the main stem. So there you have it. We, we can see the, the Amazon flood waves from space by tracking the weight of water. Quite astounding. And similarly, we can do the same for drought because um, you know, long groundwater levels being depressed by drought conditions can be seen in the GRACE data. And this is an animation from Isabella Velocona's group at University of California, Irvine, which shows a, grouts, a drought severity index um, changing over time. And this is fantastically useful information for anything from government planners to, I don't know, if you were you know, focusing on spot markets for uh, agricultural products, this might be really good information for you. So, Grace, fantastically interesting satellite measures storage. More obvious for the water cycle would be something that measures precipitation. And, and there we have satellites over time that have done this. A particular one is GPM, the Global Precipitation Measurement Mission. And this is a dual frequency radar and a multi-channel microwave imager. And that gives us precipitation values, more or less at a, a reasonably high resolution, 10 kilometer spatial resolution, and 30 minute in time. And that's a fantastic input to hydrological models to try and simulate water flows over the land surface. Uh, now, uh, just a digression, I should say in this, if I don't mention your favorite satellite, I do apologize. I, I do have a, a slight confession to make. I'm not actually uh, a satellite person. I'm a, a numerical modeler. I just happen to know and use satellites for particular purposes. So if, if there is a, your favorite satellite and I'm not mentioning it, it's not because I don't like it, it's just because I'm probably not very aware of uh, exactly what it does. So uh, you can put me right in the questions and uh, uh, we'll talk about it afterwards. So if, if you can measure large changes in storage and you can measure precipitation, you probably want a mission that can give you some kind of fine-grained detail on soil moisture. Because floods, you've got to have two things. Tons of rainfall and also wet ground to start off with. If you have one or the other, you probably don't have a flood. If you get them together, your problems are going to be magnified. And that connection is a very non-linear relationship. So measuring soil moisture at the surface in, in high uh, detail and hopefully precision is going to be really important. And the instrument that does that is called SMAP, the Soil Moisture Active Passive. 
and it combines a radar and a radio radiometer with this really quite weird six meter rotating antenna that goes across the surface. But what it gives you is volumetric soil moisture for the top five centimeters of the soil column. At, again, pretty high resolution, nine kilometers, and every two to three days, which given that soil moisture changes a little less rapidly than precipitation, that, that's not so bad. And here we see an image of, of the soil saturation status for flooding that happened in North Carolina in October 2015. And the dark blue here is extremely saturated soils. And this was a huge event, and you, you can see exactly why it was such a, a widespread regional flooding issue be, from the extent of, of the saturation that was measured by SMAP. So, we have ways of getting the, the inputs to the flooding problem. What about the downstream consequences? And, and actually, you know, for a very long time, we've had instruments that, that have done this, all the way back to the very first Landsat missions. But we have both optical and synthetic aperture radars that measure flood extent from space with varying degrees of fidelity and accuracy. So here on the left, you see uh, some MODIS and Landsat data of Porto Alegre in Brazil. And you can see it's very obvious where the flood waters are. And on the right, I've put, some, uh, put a, a satellite SAR image from the ERS-1 satellite, now defunct, of flooding on the River Meurs in, in, on the Dutch-Belgian border from January 1995 that I used in one of my very early uh, papers post my PhD. And you can see that you can pick out the, the smooth black water surface against the, the speckly, noisy land. But you can also see in this image the problem of doing this. It, it's quite hard to pick out areas of flooding in SAR um, and get that precisely correct. Nevertheless, we have SARs that do that. And if you go to airborne SARs that are a bit more tuned and, and tunable, you can sometimes do a really good job. So this is some data from another one of my papers. Um, this is airborne synthetic aperture radar data from an, a military X-band radar system that was flown over some floods that occurred in the UK in November 2000. And we managed to prize the data out of the UK military. They didn't tell us very much about how the instrument worked, um, but you can see from the, the imagery that it's really impressive. So this is one meter resolution SAR, airborne SAR. And it's much easier to pick out the, the difference between wet and dry areas. And what you see here is a, basically a, an urban area in the middle of the floodplain. And the reason it's there is it sits on a very slight island, uh, and therefore it, it's almost completely protected from the floods. And then let's think about the mission that I'm most involved in. Um, and this is something called the Surface Water Ocean Topography Mission. And this was, again, uh, a partnership of very different space agencies with quite a large budget. But this is the first SWATH-based altimeter. So altimeters measure surface water heights. And up till the advent of SWAT, the only instruments we had were nadir pointing. They, they measured in a line directly beneath the instrument. Now, SWAT has one of those as well. You can see Nadir altimeter there on the graph. But it also has two uh, interferometric radars. Uh, of, course it's, of course, it's got two interferometric radars. You'd need two radars to do interferometry. Um, nevertheless, what SWAT is able to do is SWAT-based measurements of height. So instead of lines of height data hundreds of kilometers apart, we now have the almost the entire planet completely mapped and water elevation recorded in a vast array of freshwater habitats and locations. Now, SWAT launched in December 2022 with a three and a half year mission lifetime. And the data look fantastic. Um, they're by, by far exceeding their, their performance characteristics. And so we're doing some, be able to do some really amazing things. So SWAT measures the whole global ocean. Lakes, rivers greater than 50 meters wide, lakes bigger than six hectares, so pretty small, every 10 days to decimetric accuracy. 
and it sees global rivers and lakes in incredible detail that we've never seen before. So these are the SWOT observable rivers, a total of 200, over 200,000 separate river reaches that we can now see and measure the elevation of from space. Similarly with lakes, these are all the global lakes that we can now measure the height of. Nearly six million of them. You know, imagine if you're, I don't know, Canada, Finland, one of these northern uh, countries with, with huge numbers of lakes in your country. Yeah, I'd, I'd hesitate to think how many uh, uh, level gauges were installed on Canadian lakes prior to the advent of SWAT. I'm going to guess that the Canadian government had access to a few hundred to a few thousand lake levels. With the advent of SWAT, it's going to have access to millions. It's going to see all these lakes across the, uh, the tundra going up and down in response to their hydrological connections and the local hydrological signal. It's a fantastic database of environmental change. And just to give you a taste of what that might look like, here's some data from Jida Wang of the University of Illinois, which shows SWAT measured mean water surface elevations on global lakes over a five-month period at the start of this year. And you can see, for example, the high elevation of lakes on the Tibetan Plateau and along the Andes chain in Chile. You can see lakes in, you can see the, the, the vast number of lakes across northern territories. You know, Canada is almost completely painted in. There are so many lakes there above six, six hectares that SWAT is now measuring. Quite astounding data. You know, we went from terra incognita with nothing, practically nothing there, to more data than we, we know really how to use at the moment. And that's the challenge is to, to, over the next few years is to sort that out. And by fusing SWAT data with other algorithms with numerical models, we can do a couple of things. We, we can actually measure river discharge from space. And where SWOT data is of high quality, the, the results are really spectacular. So here's an ex just one example stud study. This is the Marioni River. And you can see how the, the uh, SWOT is able to track the values recorded at an in situ gauge with quite high confidence. If we can do that in all 200,000 river reaches globally, we'll be able to do things like, for the first time, measure the water uh, running off the continents into the oceans, and actually be able to put a, a measured number on that rather than just kind of uh, best guess. And lastly, on the right-hand panel, you can see some research from my group at the University of Bristol, where we're actually taking the SWAT water elevation data um, and those are the, the black dots. We're fitting the water surface slope that we expect through those data. So our fitting process is able to ignore outliers due to radar, radar layover and shadow. And then we're able to use numerical models and uh, uh, hydrodynamic equations to infer where the riverbed should have been to create that observed water surface. And in this plot here, we're just looking at one single SWAT overpass. But SWAT's coming over every 10 days. Over the mission lifetime, we'll build up many tens, nearly 100 such plots for every river on the planet. Taking all those data and ingesting them into optimization frameworks, we should be able to back out unknown river bathymetry to first order for all the SWAT observable reaches. That's not something that we'll... we'll be able to design a satellite to measure ever, probably, or certainly there's nothing, uh, there's nothing in, the, in the near to medium term that's going to solve that problem from space. But using the SWOT data and clever numerical models, we'll be able to, able to back out this major unknown, which is critical if you want to build models to predict global flood extent. Knowing how much water is going down the river channels, even during floods, those still transport almost the majority of the flow. So knowing their size is really critical. <laughs>
then lastly, there's, there's some things that we can measure from space, which are really central or really important for, hydro, for water uh, problems that have nothing to do with the hydrological cycle. And one of those things, it's something I described to uh, Parag Vase earlier on today as, as unglamorous, is being able to measure the land surface elevation. It's not something that, that satellite agencies I mean, they usually do as an afterthought or as a, uh, on the side. But actually, it's critical to huge numbers of Earth surface, Earth science problems, from volcanoes to earthquakes to floods and droughts. Knowing the shape of the land surface is, is central because gravity is clearly a, a strong driving force to river flows. And actually, the, uh, the shape, the, the slope of the Earth's surface is what controls the gravitational driving force that uh, 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 is, a, is a prime uh, uh, force in the, the dynamics of flood waves. So we do have some global terrain data sets from satellites. Uh, SRTM, flown in almost 25 years ago now, is one of them. And uh, um, the key thing here is always to, um, what we need for most of our science studies is the bare earth, whereas actually from satellites, what you get is the top of all the vegetation and building artifacts. So we've had a multi-year, multi-person effort to correct these global terrain data sets and get us back to bare earth. And you can see here over the Mekong Delta the impact of doing that. So you can see all the speckle noise and, and uh, wavelength uh, and, and satellite roll errors in the original SRTM data. And once you've corrected that, you re-establish proper connections. So water will flow over that digital terrain correctly and get to the sea. So there's lots of things like this that you might not think of as being important for the hydrological cycle, but are. I said earlier on that risks were a combination of hazards, exposure, and vulnerability. And actually, knowing what humans are doing to the, the Earth's surface is almost as important as the physical hazard itself. And to finish up the talk, there's many things still to do, and some of them are actually quite difficult. I mean, one thing that we should be able to do is to make the existing measurements we've got better. We could do with better ways of getting at evapotranspiration. You can't really measure it directly. You have to measure the things that contribute to it and then back evapotranspiration out with a numerical model. Terrain data could be better. You know, um, if, we have, if we use airborne systems, we use laser altimetry, and we get down to 10 centimetre vertical accuracy. Well, our current best satellite digital elevation data is metre level errors. Um, so there's obviously a gap to be closed there. And you can see here some airborne LIDAR data that we use for studies in the UK. It's not a photo, it's a, well, it's not a, a, a photo, it's, it's an air photo draped over a, a, the wire frame of a, a LIDAR data set. And then I think we've still got a lot to do in terms of river discharge as well to reduce some of the biases in, in methods we have at the moment. As I was saying, it's not just physical measurements. It's also things about what humans are doing. And here we'd like much better data on exposure and vulnerability in order to measure, to model risks. Increasingly, we're getting that through um, open building data sets. And here I've just put an image of the Google open building. But there's, you know, other options are available. But more than just knowing where the buildings are, I mean, that's great, but we'd like to know what those buildings are, how they're constructed, who's living there, what's their socioeconomic status, how well able are they to cope with extreme events, how resilient are they, how can they recover? And if I'm thinking about floods, the, the big thing that I can't do at the moment very well is give, you have a global map of where river flood defences and water resources infrastructure are. If we've got very good terrain data, we can do a good job of picking out where the, the flood defences might be. But for most of the world, we don't have that. Meter scale errors mean that we, uh, and coarse re spatial resolutions, 
mean that we won't see flood defences in our global terrain data sets. We, if we improve that, we might be able to. But also, it's not just levees and, and, and flood banks. It's things like locks and dams and all the ways we control rivers and all the ways we hold water on the, on the planet's surface and then release it at other times. Knowing how humans intervene in the hydrological system is also critical. And then to conclude, and I, th I think there is some time for some questions if anybody is posting them, but just to give you a few takeaway messages from all of that. And the first obvious one is that with the launch of SWAT, satellites can now measure almost all aspects of the water cycle. Being able to measure river discharge is, has closed a, a gap in our water balance equations that, we, that previously was a quite glaring hole. The intermittency of floods and droughts is a real challenge for satellite providers. You need to think about a combination of satellite data and computer models if you're going to make progress. Space technology is not going to solve this on its own. It's interesting, it's useful, but in terms of a consistent, comprehensive solution, you're going to need to talk to numerical model, modelers to interpolate and extrapolate the satellite data that you get. But this model data ecosystem is developing rapidly, despite the fact that the substantial research challenges remain. But it's an exciting time in the space science and hydrological modeling, and I hope that I've given you some flavor of that this evening. Thank you very much for listening and, and giving up beer. Thank you. Um, so if there are questions, uh, Martin here has kindly offered to run around the room with the microphone so you can call them out. Uh, so given that satellite data alone cannot solve the problems of flood and drought uh, intermittency, what specific uh, advancements in computer models are needed to complement satellite data for better water cycle management specifically? Like what advancements do we need to develop? That's so we can do a good job, or the field is, fields are developing rapidly. So we can do quite a good job of modeling uh, areas at risk of flooding globally down to really quite high spatial resolutions, around about 30 meters in the very mess models. I think what would be really helpful is improving the quality of some of the data inputs into those. So if we're thinking about forecast models for hydrology, then improving the quality of, of our, improving our ability to measure precipitation from space would be a really beneficial advance for the parts of the world which do not have good ground data, so ground meteorological stations. So I think it, it comes down to quality, if, if I was going to come up with a thing. Do what we do now, but let's do it better. Hello. Hi there. Hi. So um, impressive measurements in terms of um, water quantity and altitude and so on. I wondered in terms of water quality, things like harmful algal bloom and other things that can happen if we have data that can help assess the impacts. That's a very good question. Um, the optical satellites that we have have been able to give us some indications on water quality for quite some time. But I don't think, until relatively recently, I've heard people talking about dedicated missions for water quality. But those discussions are now starting to happen. And over the past 18 months, two years, I, I have, uh, it's not my field, but I have heard and talked to colleagues who've got a strong interest in developing those kinds of missions, uh, mission concepts that might fly in the next five to 10 years, I guess. Um, so the answer is it's something we, we can kind of dabble with, with optical satellites, but I don't think it's something we do very well at the moment, but we probably could. Thank you. Martin, there's 
thanks a lot for the presentation. So uh, you shared quite a lot of data uh, concerning the um, Africa, Pakistan, and developing countries. And uh, you obviously have analyzed quite a lot, but is this data free to share with those developing countries, especially who cannot afford uh, having their own satellite and a processing power? So as I understand it, I mean, if it's NASA satellite data, it's free to air. Um, I'm pretty sure that most ESA data is, is free to air as well. Um, in terms of the, the downstream product, so if it's ingested into numerical models, then it depends who's doing that. Um, so, for example, one of the things I do as well as my role at the university is I am chairman of a business that does flood risk analytics. And we build global maps of flood inundation. Now, we, we finance that by licensing the data to the insurers, um, which doesn't really help developing countries, you will say. Um, fortunately, one of the, the nice people, groups of people who licensed our data was the World Bank. And part of their uh, mission was to make the data available. So actually for, um, uh, I think, about 20, you know, really the most deprived, most war-torn, difficult countries, the data that we've commercially created is now available for free. So there are, there are ingenious partnerships yeah. if somebody uh, philanthropic like the World Bank chooses to intervene. That, that, that's a great thing. And do you also have the capacity and capability to give them a pre-warning uh, before a flood or a drought? So we, people are doing that in particular parts of the world. I mean, there is a... Um, there's a program at European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecasting called GLOFAS, the Global Flood Alert System. And for particular places, for example, Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office in the UK funds people in my research team to take those flood forecasts and turn them into maps and then distribute them via Red Cross, Red Crescent, and other humanitarian organizations in country in order to do things like establish it, um, you know, uh, airdrop locations, n decide which roads are going to be impassable, uh, identify where the, the main zones of risk are. So yeah, there, there is a, there's a free-to-air global program called GLOFAS at, at ECMWF, and then there's ad hoc local programs funded by some governments, for example, the UK government, to turn that into more tailored forecasts for particular places. So some of these things are ongoing. It, 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 it's not perfect, but it's not completely bleak either. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Can you tell us which capabilities need to be developed or expanded in order to allow rapid response of ongoing events, whether it's detection or monitoring? Thank you. Um, so I would say, again, it comes back to the question I answered right at the start. There's quite a lot of uh, low latency data for flood extent mapping, for example. Um, droughts are more kind of slow burn. so latency is less of an issue, but it's a really critical issue with floods. We have a bunch of satellites at the moment that can map floods from space, SARS, uh, optical images, and some of those can be processed and turned around quite quickly, and there's been a lot of work on rapid uh, flood extent mapping of the, of the kind that you, you talk about. I'm more interested in, in using those data to validate my numerical models after the fact. And one of the things that I worry about when I come to do that is if I'm comparing my model to some data, that, mo that data's got to be of a pretty high quality. Otherwise, the comparison doesn't really mean very much. And my experience of using rapidly developed flood extent maps is that the quality is hugely problematic. And if it's problematic for my vo model validation, it's also problematic for decision making. So I think really what needs to be, f we need a very strong focus, not, on, not so much on rapid mapping, but on quality mapping. And I, I think the errors in the mapping technologies that we, mapping algorithms we have at the moment, are too high for decision making. But, you know, it, 
it depends on the decision and what you're trying to do in some, some respects. You know, sometimes imperfect data is good enough to take a decision. You don't need perfect foresight. Um, but in general, I, I think quality needs to be improved. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the very clear presentation. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, I'm not going to ask about a specific satellite I like, but oh. rather about a oh, technique good. I'm interested I'm in. I'm sorry I didn't mention it. I'm sure I didn't. <laughs> no, 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 it's fine, it's fine. It's about a technique rather than a satellite. Um, so I wanted to hear what's your take on the uh, potential of GNSS reflectometry in studying floods. Oh, I'm not sure I even know what that technique is. So you'll, you'll have to explain it to me. So I'm going to say it's got great potential. Is that okay. the right okay. answer? Okay, <laughs> I like that. I like that. Thank you. Tell, tell me about it afterwards. I'm curious now. Sure. <laughs> All right, so I'm always curious about what comes next. So now that you've had a good look at the SWAT data and been able to use it for a while. What follows it? Well, I mean, it's, it's only got a three and a half year mission lifetime. So if we're thinking about floods, in most places, it, it won't see very much. Um, what could we do? I mean, SWOT is a collaboration between the hydrology and the oceanography communities. Um, the oceanographers have some strong requirements on the orbit uh, in order to not alias the tides. But the orbit is suboptimal optimal for surface water, so you could think of a SWAT follow-on with, with different orbit configurations, and maybe we can do that cheaper. Um, I think something that's going to have longevity in orbit as well um, would be really helpful in terms of floods and droughts. You know, these are extreme events. They happen in a given place very rarely, so you have to wait for quite a while in order to see something interesting. So that could be fixed. Um, and I think there's a few little wrinkles with the, the SWOT data that we can iron out in a, in a second version. But mostly, the, the technique seems to be working better than we expected it to. No. Um, so you like the capability. The bottom line is uh, more of it and continuity. Exactly. Thank you. I think that looks like we're done. So I'll finish there and say thank you very much for coming along and listening. Thank you for the questions, and uh, have a good rest of your week. Take care.